Peer review is one of the strongest endorsements a fund manager can get. And in the Australian small cap or emerging companies market, if you ask a fund manager who they rate or who they'd let them manage their money, Ophir is one of the firms that will regularly come up. And today in LiveWise CIO Profile Series, I'm joined by Stephen Ng, who is one of the portfolio managers and co-founders of Ophir. We're going to talk to him about their investment process, how they're viewing the emerging companies landscape on the Australian market today, and we'll learn about some of the stories and, uh, and wounds, battle scars that they've picked up along the way. So Stephen, great to have you in here at LifeWire and thanks for coming in. No, thanks for having me. Why don't we start off and um, just get into a quick background on, on how you got started in investing and what your introduction to the um, to this skill was? Yeah, sure. Actually, I was quite a late bloomer coming into this industry. Uh, my background traditionally was initially in accounting, and then I moved into management consulting with Bain International, and then also did a bit of secondment work at um, Diageo. And really, at that point in time, it sort of sort of saw the full spectrum of what was available in terms of sort of corporate work. On one hand, there were fantastic opportunities dealing with a CEO at a strategy level. And then at the same time, there was also the real minutia of detail that you could get into in a corporate. And really what I wanted to do was try and find something that I could blend the two in and speak the skill sets out of that. So when I then scanned the landscape and sort of had that sort of epiphany moment of what would be my next sort of career step, investing was one of them. And through a bit of hard work, a bit of determination, just a bit of luck, I managed to break into, into the industry and join the Macquarie Cap small team back in 2001. And that's where I began my investing and prior to that, at a personal level, had you been investing? Yeah, once again, I was probably a late bloomer within that stage. I think when I reflect back, my, my first stock pick was during those heady days of the demutualisations of buying something like a, an NRMA at the time or a New South Wales tab. So I was probably a very bad shot at in terms of picking investments back in that. But if there's anything that I've learned, you know, since joining the industry, it's the continual learning process, which just makes it so exciting. And, you know, it's something that you can never perfect and you're always going to get better and better at it each time. So it's really one where experience counts over time. So we're going to get into the philosophy that you've put around how Ophir invests in a, in a little bit. But between 2001 and when you started Ophir, you worked with Macquarie, you mentioned there, and also Paradise Investment Management, which is a very well regarded firm. What were some of the um, lessons and, um, you know, I guess the, the learnings that you've picked up through your experience at those groups? Yeah, I, I suppose the, the, the key learning that I've had in there is that, you know, the number one criteria in investing is always passion. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the hardest working. You just have to be the most passionate, the person that's always going to go over and above and beyond in terms of trying to get that next big idea, get that edge on that stock, and then just really following through. So if there's one thing that's passion, the second one that I've learnt through all, both of those shops is really just backing your conviction in the calls. There's going to be at times when the market's right and there's also going to be at times when you're right. And it's really that's when you sort of separate the men from the boys in picking up, standing up against the market, proving that your analysis is correct and really following through. And that's really when you make the best investments of all. Mm, interesting. So high conviction is a, a bit of a stamp of your investing style. Can you go into some more detail around how you think about high conviction and concentration and, and, and overall the philosophy for which you're approaching the market? Yeah, sure. In terms of where we look at the market now, you know, you can have your traditional small cap portfolio and that's generally been over time portfolio consisting of 40 to 50 stocks that's, that, that sits within there. But, you know, it's, it's probably fair to say, you know, it's been proven over many times and, and, and been also through practice that, you know, a portfolio of 15 to 20 stocks provides enough diversification for you in any portfolio that you have. So I'd always challenge any manager to say, really, does you know, your 50th or 60th stock, do you really have that much conviction in it? Is it really going to add that much incremental um, attribution or contribution to your portfolio? Probably unlikely. If anything, that just adds extra noise to the process. What we really like is backing ourselves, backing our analysis, doing that extra bit of homework that no one else has done and really knowing the companies better than anyone else. And as I said before, there's going to be times when we're going to have to stand up to the market and really taking a stand so what we really love at Ophir with that high, our high conviction fund, it's that every stock counts. We've got high conviction in the stocks, we've got high convictions in where they can grow into and how big they can be. And it's really backing those people and backing those management teams as part of that journey. And we've had numerous success stories in that time. You've mentioned a few times about needing to take a stand against the market and, and backing your own conviction and analysis. What's an example? Talk me through that. 
Yeah, a couple that, you know, we've also played, you know, A2 oh, actually, A2 Milk is one that, you know, when the market was sort of selling these off during the early 2016 periods, we took a stand within that period to build a position and increase our weights during that era. But, you know, the, the, the war stories are, are numerous effectively within the space. We probably, you know, just as you get some right, you also get some wrong. So whilst we say to you, we always love to take a stand and we always get it right, unfortunately, that's never the case. But, you know, it's backing the calls at the right periods of time, you know, and look, if we get more than one and two right, we're doing really well within that space. The company visit visitation process that Ophir um, boasts, it's, it's one of the things that you guys hang your hat on is that you have a very heavy company visitation process. What are the CEOs telling you today? What are some of the highlights from meetings that you're having at the moment? Yeah, it, it, it's, a pro it's a something as part of the process. It's always very important for us. We do over five to 700 meetings one-on-one -on -one with, with companies, typically at their offices. Um, so it's something that we were always very um, proud to do. But it's also not just doing those meetings, but it's also doing meetings outside of that and visiting some of their competitors, visiting their suppliers, trying to visit some of the operations that are also in that space, but really just going above and beyond and trying to find information. You know, during all those meetings that we've had, look, it probably hasn't materially changed over the big period of time that we've, in the last year or two, I think it's still tough within retail. No one's really singing the praises that they're, you know, the barbarians at the gate with Amazon about to come in and attack them. But look, the retailers are here are probably more prepared than any other retailer. They've studied what's happened in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Spain. So that's a sector that, you know, whilst under threat, they're probably well prepared for, but the market's already factored in. You know, the, the, the one big trend that we've seen and one big, um, a theme that's emerging in terms of the companies that we've talked to, you know, is that we believe that the mining sector is bottomed for now. You can see that the um, the order books are increasing, the confidence to invest has uh, has restored within those particular companies, yet at the same time, the companies themselves have right-sized themselves and become very efficient within that space. So we think the operating leverage can be quite high. You know, and then aside from that, it's probably just the individual stock stories that we hear, you know. IT continues to be a very strong predominant theme within that space. Travel continues to do well in that area. So really it's the selective pockets that we're seeing out there in the market that I talked about that are doing well. But it's probably fair to say that overall, you know, things are probably the same. I don't think it's as rosy as what it ever was and I don't think it ever will be. But it's up to us to try and find those pockets where companies are really doing well and getting on board those companies and backing the teams as part of that growth that they're going through. The commentary in the mainstream newspapers tends to focus on on the negative. Do you think that it's being overcooked how bad things are in Australia at the moment? Do you think things are bubbling along, along okay from the meetings you're having? Yeah, I think, and, and we're always going to be biased because we're going to be talking to those companies that we think they are going to do well because we're ultimately biased towards those companies that we want to own. So therefore, we've sort of got a more selective subset of companies that we are. And we have talked about those ones that we think are doing well, like IT like ones exposed to the mining services, also those exposed to an infrastructure spend. Similarly, on the other side, you know, retail continues to be tough. You know, we only saw yesterday, specialty fashion is going to close 300 stores. I mean, out of a store footprint of a, a thousand stores, that's going to send a signal to all the mall owners effectively here within Australia. So, yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the conditions still remain difficult at the moment, but, you know, we remain very optimistic in terms of the companies that we have. You know, we only have to look at our portfolio, you know, we'd have north of 50% of the earnings of our portfolio probably generated overseas now. When I started in the industry back in 2001, having overseas exposed was generally seen as a negative. People used to put it at a discount in terms of what could happen because generally something went wrong, it was too far from Australia, we didn't generally travel overseas. It, it was never considered a sort of a growth option or a premium. Uh, you roll forward to now, late 2017, you know, you've got all these fantastic businesses with over overseas growth options. The markets are infinitely bigger than Australia's population of 20 million. It just becomes exciting. You only need to capture one, two percent of a very big market as opposed to 20 percent of a tiny market. And you can have a fantastic outcome for the, for the business and its growth profile. So, so what's an example of a company that you think is just doing an outstanding job of executing overseas? Yeah, well, if I just, before I even go overseas, you know, if I just talk about just the rate of growth of what can happen and the changes that I've seen, is that previously, you know, back in the days of starting early in 2000, if you saw growth rates of 15 to 20%, that used to be phenomenal. Nowadays, you know, you only can think of examples like A2 Milk or Afterpay, you know, two companies that over a space of only three, four years have grown exponentially. You know, some of the facts and figures that you can think of is that 
in 2014, A2 Milk was generating $100 million worth of sales. It's now going to generate north of $700 million worth of sales in 2018. That's a seven times increase. That's phenomenal in three or four years for selling what is a traditionally slow moving product, infant milk formula. But you know, with the advent of technology, WeChat, you know, Tmall, the ability to communicate, the ability to tap into new markets that Australians probably weren't able to do for, is just phenomenal. So that growth is incredible. The, the promise of Chinese growth or accessing the Chinese market has been a carrot dangled in front of Australian investors numerous times, and there's been you know countless examples of sort of. Um, you know, the companies coming back with their tail between their legs and some relatively recent examples. How do you get conviction that A2 is going to be able to really execute into these growth markets? Yeah, I, I think when we look at it and, we, and we, when we've analysed A2 Milk, you look at the management of the channel, that, that if there's anything that A2 Milk has performed exceptionally well, it's managing how that business transacts with its customers by the various channels of the way that the product can get to market. In actual fact, if anything, I'd call that whole world opposite world is how I look at it internally. Because traditionally, if you were an FMCG company and you needed to clear inventory, you used to discount it. And as a result, if you discount it, it became cheaper to the Australian consumer and then it would ultimately flow through and you'd sell it through. With that whole A2 milk selling to China, selling into the Daegu market, whereby they're banking on a margin, you discounting actually makes it worse for them. They're actually going to be losing money every time you sell it to it. In actual fact, price increases are good because they're actually able to make more money, increases the premium of the product, and also just facilitates that flow of the product within there. So that's just one example where we can think, you know, them, A2 Milk, monitoring the channel, controlling the wholesalers, and actually the last time that we talked to them, they had north of two to 300 um, store or company visits themselves in terms of them checking the channels and seeing how much stock is in there. And so they were managing it very diligently. One of the companies that you know also wanted to just raise, we just talk about, it's just participating at the moment in a domestic market, but you know also talk about this rapid growth that we historically haven't seen in some of these companies in Australia, but it's just showing you the advent of technology, and is actual fact you know the opposite of, of what's happening in the retail sector. But a company like Afterpay, you know, which you know only started a couple of years ago, but effectively has gone from almost call it minuscule sales of a couple of million dollars to be processing you know, on an annualised basis north of $2 billion worth of retail sales, all predominantly online, is a phenomenal effort and they have executed flawlessly. You know, they would be processing north of 25% north of, um, of online sales at the moment and maybe 5% of total online sales. That's a truly exceptional outcome from any management team to have executed on that. And we remain you know, equally excited in the future of what it can do. But it just demonstrates to you how fast the market is moving. And whilst you're always going to have some adversities, like we talked about, retail, Amazon, their onslaught, them taking share. On the other hand, you've got a company here who's helping them. You know, if you know, whilst there's a war happening between the retailers and Amazon, you've got Afterpay, which is providing the weapons to the retailers to combat back. It's and like the second derivative. Exactly. So, you know, it, they're helping the sales. You know, the average basket size is higher, the conversion size is higher. You're driving traffic to, to the retail so Just phenomenal stuff. You know, for a business that you know probably didn't exist four or five years ago, and you know has it hit its straps in the last two years. You just look at it. Twenty five percent of retail sales. The opportunities are endless, effectively, in terms of where it can get to, and the execution has been flawless to date. High growth, high PE, high expectations is the perfect recipe for a bumpy ride. Is that part and parcel of what you're doing? Yeah, look, we ultimately take a, a balanced approach to our portfolio, and whilst we do have some high growth names within there, we ultimately do look at valuation. I mean, the key criteria for our investment methodology is is the company a good company and can it grow into a big market? Does it earn a good return on capital in terms of how much we give to it? And then more importantly, does it have a good balance sheet and can we, and more, and can we value it? We, we immediately screen out a lot of companies that we just believe too conceptual in nature, something that we'll never be able to understand meaningfully or have an edge on. Internally, we have a rule, we're only on level two in the lift and you can't explain what the company time, that company does by that time you're in the lift, then we're not going to own it. It's a relatively short lift ride, so we've got to be really quick in terms of what it does. That screens out a lot of opportunities. So whilst I've talked about a few growth names, it's by no means the predominant factor within our portfolio. In the end, valuation rules, as my old manager used to say, 
you don't really make money buying anything on 20 times. But then again, that was 20 years ago. Nowadays, I believe, you know, the, the, the metrics have changed because of where interest rates are. But in the end, you know, internally, we always say growth hides all sins. If companies grow and they can grow into big markets and can deliver and execute, I think shareholders will always be well rewarded as part of that. But as you said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Very nice. Um, Stephen, through your time at Paradise and again at Ophir, you were uh, very early investors in some of the, the darling or the, the great growth stocks of Australia. Examples I'm thinking of TPG, I believe you were the first institutional holder there, substantial holder, Magellan, REA. Taking TPG, for example, what led you to identify these future stars in the very early days? Yeah, TPG was a situation that came up where like, there was a line of stock being offered and we had to make a very quick decision on it. But the valuation looked like it stack up, st stood up in terms of, of owning it. But really it was contacting its competitors in that space that made us, that got us across the line, whereby in a very short period of time, it was clearly identified that da David Teo was a very smart guy. And the fact that he had the respect of his competitors uh, in the space, when we called them up and asked them for a bit of a so-called reference check, um, is you know was highly complimentary. You know, it's always easy to, to for a competitor to badmouth another one, and that's fair enough. They're battling with each other every day. They're fighting for that extra dollar within them. But when you have a competitor that's very complimentary of of, of, of an investee company that we're looking at, that means that they're highly respected. Be it be either how they behave, the way they invest capital, the way they manage their businesses. You know. We're always going to be backing the strong management teams with the good references. So on that topic, the telco landscape remains highly competitive and um, TPG and, and, and Vocus and, and Telstra as well, they've all taken a bit of a hit as a result of that. What's your take on that landscape at the moment? Yeah, I, th I think in terms of that whole telco landscape from a small cap perspective, if you, if you go back five, ten years ago, it was extremely fragmented. You had M2, you had Vocus, you had IINet, you had TPG. And they're just some of the names I can spring off the top of my mind. You also had Big Air and a few other ones within that space. Amcom out west. Effectively, that whole space has been consolidated now. So I think the run rate and the growth has become more of an organic growth story rather than an acquisition synergies and growth stories within that space. So for us, that's probably not the easy pickings for us to look at. We've got to find that next industry that we can find whereby you know, a competitor might only have 2-3% market share and can organically grow. You know, if I was to think across some of the stocks within the portfolio, Credit Corp which is a company that we own, you know, very dominant market share here within Australia, you know, whereby they might be buying close to 30, 40% of the purchase debt that's sold here. But what really got us excited is they've been incubating a business in the US now, and that's been going for five years. They're now in a stage whereby that business has just purchased north of over $55 million in debt. But the exciting thing about that business is it's participating in a pool that's $4 billion. Even if it only bought 1%, that's $400 million worth of debt that it's buying. It's going to be twice the size of Australia. That's one there whereby you said the, the runways and the opportunities will just continue to be growing. I mean, the, the, it's just phenomenal what they, they can achieve and it's all just now about execution and them delivering the returns in that space of what they've got. Yeah, interesting. Um, just in terms of um, the small cap space, things are um, running really nicely at the moment. The past quarter has been excellent for the, for the emerging companies and smaller companies on the ASX. 12 months ago, it wasn't such a, a, a pretty picture and there was some pretty, I imagine a period where it's probably one of the most severe um, drawdowns since mm. you set up the fund. Um, what was behind it last year? And more importantly, what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, sure. In terms of that period, and it really kicked off from October 2016, we, we've called it the three R's. There was the reinflation trade, whereby people thought that global growth, which was previously quite difficult, was now going to be picking up. That caused our second R, which was the rotation, where people had previously gone down to small caps to look for growth. They then started gravitating immediately back up to the, the larger cyclicals like the banks and the resources. And, and that caused the third R, which was both the redemptions. So it was the large cap managers selling out, and then there was also some um, small cap money that was lost within the sector as well. So that caused an more, enormous amount of selling pressure on, on the companies. 
So when we look at our performance back in 2016, and it was extremely frustrating for us, our companies were doing well, our ratio of upgrades to downgrades was in line with our ex historical experience, yet every time the stocks reported positive numbers, that just fell another five or six percent. So it was an extremely difficult period. Um, that being said, that sort of washed itself through and ultimately, you know, the market's a weighing machine and it's not a popularity contest in the short term. So th th those fundamentals that, of what happened during the period, those companies that we owned and continue own actually did continue to deliver. They continue to, 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 to beat their guidance. They continue to do acquisitions and they continue to grow as part of that, of our process in, in evaluating them. And so when we look back at that time, it actually proved to be a good buying opportunity. And then that's in actual fact what we did within that space. We did actually purchase shares in some companies that had been sold off, like NextD, NextDC. It also allowed us to establish positions in other companies where nothing had fundamentally changed. And so it was a good opportunity. That being said, I think it's an important time now to sort of highlight, look, you know, we've probably been never as excited about our portfolio companies in what they can do and what they can achieve over the next period of time. But it's fair to say valuations are fair. So therefore, I think with, with any investor there going forward from here, you've just got to be very cognizant of valuations. That will ultimately be the anchor on a stock. So therefore, whilst the growth is good, you've always got to be very disciplined on valuations and it's none more so than now. Right now, is there any reason why we couldn't see all of those three R's roll out again, or at least a few of them? I'm, a lot of the commentary I read seems to be quite bullish on, on that yeah, potential I, for reflation. Yeah, I think the main one would be the, the reflation trade. You know, it's probably been delayed a little bit, but you can see that we've got more synchronised growth. And look, we're never macro in the end, so we're only anecdotally seeing and hearing what we can feel, but it feels like overall the economies are picking up. I think interest rates definitely have to increase over time as uh, inflation picks up. So therefore you would assume that th that reflation trade occurs. In regards to those other two R's, I don't think they'll probably play through as predominantly as what they are going through at the moment. It's, you know, the, the large cap guys who have exited probably haven't come back in full force of what they have previously and the redemption small caps seem to have settled. That being said, I think it always comes down to, it's gonna be a stock picker's market. It's gonna be picking the right companies at the right price and watching them execute as part of that space. In the end, it all boils down to execution. So can you take my viewers inside the room to the, um, to the investment committee at Ophir and, and talk me through a, a pitch of a, a long idea that really ticks your process? Can you break, it, break an idea down for us and, and pitch me a long idea? Yeah, I mean, like I said, one of our top holdings at the moment is Credit Corp, whereby with, you know, in, in terms of its return on capital is high, an established and credible management team that has been very disciplined for a long period of time generating the returns that it has. You know, this is the same management team that pulled it out from its depths back in 2006, 2007 when the stock price created, you know, down into the, the, the low dollar, the 10 to 15 cents or so, whatever the lows were, it's now like north of, um, in the highs again from where it is. But it's a team that's executed well. But more importantly, it's a team that has able, been able to step out in its growth areas systematically disciplined and without issuing a lot of any equity within that space. In actual fact, it's one of the few companies when I look back over time that the share count's still the same. But it's executed well and earned, you know, a, a 30, 20-30% market share within its debt ledger purchase. It's then executed into its loan business and grow in that space. And where we get really excited is if it can even replicate half of its success in the US, then look, it's going to be a big business by any, in the future. One of the things that uh, holds true at Ophir, or, or one of the things that you, you tell people, is that you believe capacity and limiting capacity is um, a really important part um, of the process for the space that you invest in. Given that one of your funds I know is at capacity and closed, and the other one, from what I gather, is very close to being closed, um, five years into your journey, what, what, what happens next? Yeah, it's probably just worthwhile actually talking, well, why do we do that? Because I think what, what, one of the, you know, the key elements that we'd always like to leave behind with our investors is that alignment and passion are probably the two characteristics of what you'll see with anybody that works in a fear. Uh, Andrew and I have the majority, if not all of our personal wealth are tied in within our funds. So we're very aligned with our unit holders what we're motivated by and what we're passionate about is delivering performance not only for our unit holders but being greedy ultimately ourselves 
We see our investment within the funds as a long-term compounding vehicle for us to create wealth. And so therefore, limiting capacity is something that will always provide that ability to do that. We've seen other examples where people effectively are just asset collectors within the space. You know, and over time that will just make it difficult. So we're very disciplined in terms of managing the capacity, ensuring that the capacity is the property and the ownership and the asset of the clients, and that if we maintain our capacity and are strict in terms of how much we take in, then we're always at least going to give ourselves a fighting chance to perform. So if there's anything of what next that we do at Ophir, I'd probably always leave the message that whatever it is, it'll be capacity constrained. It'll be something that we believe that we can deliver and perform in that product for an extended period of time. And Andrew and I will put our money where our mouth is and put our own personal wealth and, and back it as we have with all our other products and continue to do so in the future. Well, Stephen, thanks very much for taking the time to come in and speak with Livewire and provide an insight into how you're seeing the market and investing today. And we wish you continued success with the business at Ophir. Thanks very much.